What you're going to hear today is a number of things kind of off the top of the head, but also I'm asking for some feedback from you. Uh, if I don't get feedback from you, it's going to be just like a wind-up toy at Christmas. You know, I'm just going to go through my presentation and you get what you get. If, however, if you have questions, uh, unless it really gets out of hand, why I will uh, entertain questions as we go and try to take care of those. I've spent a number of years uh, not only talking to farmers, but also talking with undergrad and graduate students about uh, pork production, the, the manure management and structure side of things. So I kind of started out with some general questions about pits. You know, what, what kind of questions would a, a normal person of any place across the audience ask about pits? So, you know, what's a deep pit and why should I care? You know, what could possibly go wrong with a pit? It's a basement for Pete's sake, you know? Um, how can I make pits work better? Biosecurity could be an issue. Fertilizer benefits, and then uh, we get maybe at the end some chuckles on new pit construction boo-boos, and maybe they're not so funny. Depends on where you're, which side you're coming from. If you think about it, all the things that a deep pit actually represents. Well, first of all, it's a container. It's a big container for a liquid that that has to be regarded as a potential water pollutant. It's also this reservoir that lets us do some timely placement of, uh, of nutrients on crops. It's a conservation component. So it keeps the quality of those manure nutrients until you're ready to spread them. It's also a structure that acts as a foundation for the building. And it's maybe we don't think about this so often, but it's a component of the building's ventilation system. So real quickly, we go through some just a little questioning of each one of those. Timely placement, you know. Do, do we use it for timely placement or do we get ourselves into a situation where we're spreading maybe in the winter when we shouldn't be? Um, are we really conserving the nutrients or, or are we putting them up in the air and having a lot of, of uh, volatilization of, of nutrients? Is it a good foundation? Yes, this is a real. And some of you in the back, who've, maybe this belongs to one of you, but this is from over across the river, so... Nobody in Missouri would build like this, but you need to at least see it. Um, and while we're on that topic, I want to talk about slats for just a second. Slats don't last forever, even though we would like to think that they do. So we've had, of course, in Illinois, and you've probably seen the same kind of thing at various places in Missouri. The slats do fail on occasion, so we just need to I'm bring that up for discussion. Have you checked your slats lately? Is there a chance that you might lose some? And these are the, the kinds of of failure modes that we would see, mainly when you get start getting cracks on the underside and we get some corrosion of those, uh, those steel reinforcing bars and we can see some collapses. And sometimes it's, it's uh, not just one or two slats, it can be a pretty large failure. And then the pit ventilation. Uh, pit ventilation kind of comes and goes depending on how much room there is between the manure and the, and the bottom of the slats. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that go along with that, and we'll also talk about some foaming. Now, here's one. It's these pesky dairy guys, you know. But here's the situation. We've got uh, some equip grant money. We're going to put in some more manure storage because we've just been, things have been a little bit tight over the years. So our plan is we're going to put in a big manure storage, probably be a big pit or an outside tank. I want you to look carefully at the top of that slurry store and what has happened uh, is this slurry store, and now we've gone from a little problem to a big problem. Because look at the, the crop all around. We've, it's 1st of August. We've got green corn out in the field, no place to go, and one little puff of wind from the south, and we're going to have that dairy manure up over the top of that slurry store. We ought to be really careful with these storages. We keep building them big, bigger. We build them deeper. Sometimes we get ourselves into more of a problem if we don't plan. So the, the basis, the crux, the, the real uh, centerpiece of my talk is going to be planning. How well do we manage these pits to keep us out of getting into trouble with them? So here's some priorities. First of all, safety, indoor air quality. Uh, how do you manage that pit so that you can protect animals and workers? Uh, from the toxic gases that, that occur when you have anaerobic digestion of, of manure and maintain a good atmosphere. The second one is environmental protection. 
And these are three priorities, I think, not necessarily in, in any particular order, but I want to make sure that, that we get these covered, and there could be some others as well. So environmental protection, you know, we need to be able to inspect, monitor the pits, and, and uh, manage that capacity so that it works for us and we don't get ourselves in a bind when that, uh, that pit is full. And then the best use of the nutrients, because we have come to realize there is some real value in the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that livestock manure, and we want to be able to, to use it the best way possible. There are some safety issues, which we would be remiss if we don't talk about them. First of all, is doing a good job of ventilating those, those deep pits. Um, what happens during agitation of the manure and the gas that's emitted from, uh, from the surface of the, the manure when it's agitated? And then a little bit about foaming, if you have questions or comments about foaming. And anybody wants to sit up closer to the front, there's some handouts up here. Feel free to come up. This isn't church. You don't have to sit in the back. It's, price is the same up front, but it's up to you. Um, so we can talk about foaming a little bit. But back to the pit ventilation. Okay. We've been working on this pit ventilation thing for eons. How do you um, do a good job of pulling what we know is going to be really nasty air off the surface of the manure and get it out of the building as quickly as, as possible? If we just put a, a pit fan on the outside of the perimeter of that pit, practically speaking, you can affect the air movement inside the building, maybe 15 foot radius from that pit. Now, how many people put a pit fan every 30 feet or twice a 15? Nobody's going to put a, a pit fan that close together. It doesn't happen. So all of a sudden, we've got a compromise there in, in the quality of the uh, the air dilution, the, the gas dilution that we're doing next to the, by those pit fans. And there are some structural limits, too, on, on placing these fans. We know that there's buildings, the finisher buildings out there where every other pump out has got a, a pit fan on it and the others are sealed off. So there may be 100 feet between, uh, between pit fans. So how much are we actually doing in terms of getting the, uh, uh, the pit gases and the, the really nasty air off from the floor level inside of that barn. And the ventilation stages. I've seen barns where we have uh, stage one on really cold days. You may only have half of the pit fans running. So now we've, we've got maybe two fans at opposite corners of a big, an 80-foot wide pit that are, are running, so they can't possibly do a very effective job of, of uh, if affecting the air immediately, you know, uh, any distance from, from those fans. So we have to rely on, on dilution and, uh, and other means. Uh, variable speed fans, many of our pit fans are, are variable speed, and those, I would say they're really variable in their air delivery, not entirely reliable once you get them down to, uh, to lower than, say, lower than 50% uh, on the setting. We used to use a thing called underfloor the, the ducks under the floor to put on a pit fan. Anybody remember those? How many remember, you ever put, okay, put ducks underneath the floor? You don't see many of those anymore because easy to manage? Yeah, not really, because maybe once the manure gets up into them a little bit too high and nobody really wants to clean those things out or the, the holes, the suction holes get covered up with, with uh, cobwebs or dirty manure or something like that. So... The underfloor ducts aren't being used that much. So the bottom line on this ventilation business is pit ventilation is not really that terribly efficient, so use plenty. Use lots. Um, and it is difficult to, uh, to have enough pit ventilation on a barn. We're also finding out something about um, the moisture production of, of uh, pigs in the winter there's some, uh, some new results out from uh, Nebraska that are showing that our old assumptions about moisture production from pigs, and that's, how you've, that's the basis for ventilating in the wintertime, is to remove the moisture being produced by the animals, that maybe we're, our old numbers are maybe 30% short, 30% below what they ought to be. So where does that put us on our, on our pit <coughs> ventilation? we're probably running too, too small in that. 
All right, now I'll ask you this. If the, if the pit ventilation is, uh, is inadequate, what's the next thing that happens in your fan stages? Well, you start dropping curtains, right? You start uh, going to higher stages, and so the comfort of the pigs is going to be less if you, if you don't have enough uh, pit ventilation. So the critical times for pit ventilation, first of all, is when, there's a, when those pit fans are a high contribution of your, of your building's total ventilation rate. So small pigs, cold weather, critical time for pit ventilation. Uh, second thing is when the manure level is, is really high, so we don't have much distance between the top of the manure where the gases are coming off and the, uh, and the floor level. And then finally, there can be some really high concentrations of these toxic gases uh, and also combustible gases during the agitation of your pits and, uh, and during pumping. And, uh, and it's also possible when there's, uh, when there's foam present. Now I've heard in Missouri you don't have foam problems. There's, there's no foam on pits, but in Iowa and Illinois we have lots of foam out there, all right? So is that, that's pretty much true. No, no foam in Missouri. Yeah, okay. Not true. Well, I have to chalk that one up. Too. All right, so foam uh, does tend to make things interesting. Um, we do still have a lot of deaths, you know, pigs dying from pit gas. But we keep working on this issue, and we still lose some, some pigs every year during agitation of manure. Uh, so there's still some things to learn, even though we know, you know, we can put on paper, we can do in research studies, and if you, if you ventilate at a certain rate for a certain number of minutes, you should be able to get the, uh, the air quality down where it needs to be. We still lose pigs every year. So let's talk about this, agitation and, and pumping. Remember, that's one of the, the priorities we had for this talk was safety, keep everybody safe, keep everybody healthy. So let's just throw it out there. Of course, it doesn't hurt to have the, uh, to put the, the manure the agitation pump out in progress, put the tag on the door, make sure all the people are out, before you start agitating. Uh, get these ignition sources turned off in case you do break loose with a lot of methane because remember, we're going to be seeing uh, higher levels of methane, higher levels of toxic gas, hydrogen sulfide, and probably higher levels of, um, uh, of ammonia, which is not classified as toxic, but it is an irritant gas. But the, uh, the methane is the one that's going to to uh, give us trouble if it reaches an ignition source at the right concentration. The hydrogen sulfide is the one that's going to be killing our pigs, right? Turn off your gas supply, then we want to ventilate. Now this is just, uh, I think this comes from National Pork Board, but fans 20 to 30 CFM per pig, well, that's a nice place to start. But what I think is, is interesting here is, um, is this second thing, mixing fans. I think what we've usually seen with the uh, pigs dying and during agitation events, it's usually a, a small area or maybe one more than one small area within the, the room where pigs have been overcome. And if we had mixing fans to do some better dilution of the, um, uh, of the hydrogen sulfide gas in those areas, I think we might be able to stay away from those problems. So I think the, the mixing fans suggestion is a good one. Um, if you can keep from agitating, and this is especially important when the, the manure level is, is really close to the, the, uh, the slats. Because it's just like shaking up a bottle of Coke. If you shake it up, pop the lid, you're going to have a lot of gas being involved. And that's what's happening during the agitation. So if you can cut down the agitation until you, you know, pull liquid down a couple of feet, what's that going to do? You're going to get some pretty dilute stuff coming off of that pit right at first until you can get down to where it's safe to, to do some agitation. Um, if you can do just you know, intermittent agitation, it's always better. If you can have the pigs out of the building, that's the best thing, but that's not always possible. And then eliminate this rooster tailing, so if you can keep from throwing the liquid, pit, uh, the liquid manure up over the top of the surface and back in, that does tend to have a little bit less uh, evolution of gas. Any questions, any comments on, on the agitation business, the, the, the pig uh, uh, killing pigs with, with toxic gas and so on? Yeah, so, so the question is whether it's better just move the pigs out if you're going to be pumping. 
Um, I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a good suggestion. It's not always possible. I'll, I'll grant you that, that you can't always do it. And so then our, our, um, what's our, our fallback position? Ventilate like crazy because you need to dilute that air, the, the toxic gases. Don't break loose as much of the, of the gas, the toxic gas, by reducing agitation. Make sure that there's enough uh, headspace between the, the pit, uh, between the top of the liquid and the bottom of the slats before you do any agitation. And always uh, watch the pigs, see if anything is, is happening, see if there's any signs of distress. A lot of times you'll, you'll hear uh, pigs squealing if there's, if there's a problem, in which case you always shut off the agitation as quickly as you can to reduce the amount of gas being emitted. But I think the real key is, is dilution and possibly with the, uh, the mixing fans. I've even thought of, <laughs> of having a gas-powered weed blower outside that, that, you, can, uh, you, know, that you can squirt some, some fresh air toward a problem area from the outside, but keep the, keep the people out of the building. And then there's the foaming pits. <laughs> so we do have foaming pits in Missouri. But we've seen uh, a lot of these happen. And, and I've got case studies from back in the early 90s from nurseries, not just finishers. The, we've got uh, some universities working on the, the foaming, come on in, uh, working on the, the foaming pit issue to see what some of the, the factors are. Um, but we do know that there are um, probably some, it could be some dietary kinds of changes that are, that are causing some of the, uh, the pit foaming. There may be some additives that we can put in that can, can reduce foaming, but I don't think we have any that we can take to the bank yet. So I would expect uh, sometime in the next six months to a year, we should be able to see some pretty good uh, Pretty good answers on, on the, the foaming issue. Um, but until then, we really have to stay on top of it. There's a, I don't know, how many of you use crop oil, dry crop oil, diesel fuel, things like that? Uh, can't recommend using diesel fuel because if, if you went to ask the EPA if I could put diesel fuel out on <laughs> cropland, can't do that. Uh, crop oil, probably not a big deal. But it, it doesn't, the crop oil doesn't seem to, uh, to continue to work. So we don't have a real good solid solution for, uh, for taking care of the, of the pit foaming issue. We do know, though, that it's full of biogas. And this can be really fun. If you've got a, a pit with a bunch of, of foam on it, get your five-gallon bucket and get out there with your propane torch and get that five-gallon bucket of foam and take it over someplace where it doesn't matter. And you can give that bucket a, a bump and you get a big old flare off of that. See that yellow flame coming off? It's really good entertainment. I was hoping that if... I was hoping if I took a propane torch to this to the surface of the foam, this bucket of foam, and it goes so poosh, but it doesn't happen. It took us about 20 minutes to finally get that whole thing melted down. But you could you can give the the bucket a good bump, and this is what happens in these these exploding building incidents. I think is that not only do you have a pool of this biogas being released from the foam and, and sitting somewhere in the building, but also if you do get uh, a conflagration started, if that reaches an ignition source and you start getting a pressure wave going through that pit, I think it breaks a whole lot more of the foam and, and a lot more of the, uh, the fuel loose. Now we saw, we investigated one where we had, uh, there was enough biogas, enough methane that had drifted up near the ceiling that it sat there apparently and, and burned for quite a while because it actually charred the, uh, the PVC electric conduits and the fire investigator that saw it later, he said, this is, that is really a hot fire. That's very unusual to see in one of these situations where you have that much fuel up next to the ceiling, of this, this aluminum ceiling warped the ceiling, and it also produced enough of a pressure uh, difference that it popped a bunch of trusses, broke the, the roof trusses, things like that. It was, it was interesting. But uh, it wasn't my building. That's why I use that adjective, interesting. If it had been mine, it, I would have been pretty sad. But... Um, but it did, it did teach us some things. One thing is that if you've got any a substantial amount of foam in those pits, you need to be real careful about uh, having any ignition source in that building and crank the ventilation up, give it plenty of time to dilute before you, uh, you try to break up that foam. So it's been a, an interesting learning experience. And we do hope that we have 
we get some kind of, of a handle on this. Now, I would say that foam, those of you who have, who have had foaming versus crusting on pits before, foam has some advantages. Because if you've got foam, you tend to not have the flies. Crust, you tend to have more flies. If you got foam, you tend to not have as much solids in the bottom of the pit. Is that right? Anybody else experience that? Yeah. You tend to have less foam in the bottom, or solids in the bottom. So if we could manage this thing, and we're looking for an answer to this one, if we could manage this so we could have three to six inches of foam, you know, just manage a little bit of foam, maintain a little foam on the, on the surface, and let it go with that, maybe that's not such a bad solution all the way around. But we can't go having two and three and four feet of foam because that's a, that's a real issue. And this is what you get when you get a, a big foam bloom. It completely shuts down your, your pit ventilation system. It comes up in your slats. If you've got really small pigs in the building, we know that that's a life-threatening situation just from the fact that you can, uh, you can suffocate the pigs. Finishing pigs, they keep, t tend to keep it uh, kind of tramped down, but it still is an ugly mess. So we've got to find a solution for this thing. Anybody have any suggestions on how they control foam? How's the best way to... To take care of pit foam, this is the learning moment here. Yeah, see, so now you'll, you'll find people out in the trade show that say, hey, we got this additive that can take care of solids in the pit, it can take care of foam, all this kind of thing. Um, we'll but we'll get, get to that in a minute, but I appreciate the comment that we oftentimes buy ourselves more problems by trying to fix foam or fix another issue uh, and I think a lot of that is because of the, the biological communities within the pit. There's, um, there's a whole host of different species of microbes working in the pit. And we know from some of our earlier samples, the DNA uh, testing on those samples, that foaming uh, manure has different microbial communities than non-foaming manure. Now, if we can just figure out <laughs> how to tackle the right ones so we can control the ones that we need to, to control. That'll be great. But we're pretty well convinced that the microbial communities are different. So if you go put something in the pit, <clears throat> you're likely going to affect one or more of those communities and, and you're going to change the balance in the pit. So would I say don't experiment? Well, no, I won't go that far. But I will say that you, can, you might expect uh, some things to get out of balance if you do use additives and you just need to, to go a little careful with it. Now back to that business about planning. This is an actual one. <laughs> Again, here's a deep pit, sow unit. This never happened in Missouri. It was in Illinois. And you can see how much level, they, how much room they got left in that pit. They don't have any room. In fact, they've they shut the pit fans off because they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. So it's time to pump. And he was uh, getting started that day. I don't know where he was going to go with it because uh, the crop situation looked still pretty green. But uh, we've got to do something because that, that pit was really full. So back to this whole thing of planning again. And I know everybody's going to say, well, you didn't manage around the wet fall we had, or you didn't have to manage around the wet spring. That's right. I've been taking the task as an extension uh, person before about me living on a salary, and I don't have to worry about the, the farming. I used to be there, used to farm. Okay, but point taken. Yes, I can preach at you, and I can tell you what you ought to do, but when it really comes down to it, it's not as easy as I make it sound. Nonetheless, the responsibility is uh, is there. Talk just a little bit about biosecurity. Not going to be, I'm not going to get in deep in the PED virus and, and some of that because if there was ever anything that taught us how little we know, <laughs> how hard it is to maintain biosecurity, it's been the PED virus. We thought we were just getting PERS figured out and then here comes this one. So I'm not going to stand up here and offer a whole lot, but there are people in at the show who can uh, give you more about that. The, I would say that if you haven't looked at the biosecurity guide from the National Pork Board website, it's pretty decent. It's got a lot of good ideas in it. Uh, and there are several fact sheets now on, on the biosecurity for the PED virus that address all of, lots of different aspects of, uh, of biosecurity, not only for in the barn, but also transportation, manure hauling, and, and so on. 
good set of, of uh, preferences. But just, you know, some of the details. I know some things that um, we need to think about are managing uh, that deep pit during manure removal so that we don't have uh, somebody coming in from another job with, with a, a tanker and maybe blowing some, some manure from an infected farm back into your pit, stirring it around, things like that, because you'll, you know you'll never get rid of it. And that's the thing about the deep pits that, that I really, it, it's kind of bad. It's a downfall of the deep pit system. You never get it completely empty, right? You never, you never get it completely empty and sanitized. And so you've got to figure out a way to keep from getting what's underneath blown up to what's up above. So you don't want to aerosolize particles down below that, that could travel up above and, and infect that after you've already cleaned, uh, cleaned the barn between groups. So there are some, some things out there, but that's, that's a deeper subject than what we can get into at this time. I would, of course, take suggestions, questions from the audience, but in lieu of those, we're going to move right on. Uh, sampling manure. Now we're, let's talk about what that stuff is worth. You know we've got a really substantial amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in that liquid manure, and if we could just get the neighbors, the crop producing, non-livestock producing neighbors to realize that, what a gold mine they've got sitting next door to them. They'd be rushing at us and with their fistful of dollars, and they say, man, bring that stuff to us. Some places it happens and some places it doesn't. But when they do bring that fistful of dollars, it's your, also your responsibility to be able to say, here's what's in it. Here's what you're getting. Um, and also, if it goes on your own land, too, you need to know what the concentrations of, of nutrients are. So how do you sample that manure in the deep pit? How do you do a good job of sampling that manure? <laughs> Our regulators over in Illinois... They say, well, be sure that you draw a good composite sample when you're spreading the manure and send it in, and then next year you have a little history and, and we kind of go from there. We're, we're going to get us a, a rolling history of the nutrient value in that, in that sample, or in that, that uh, manure storage. Well, it's easy for them to say, but you might have made some changes or might have something happened that you know that last year's sample is really not going to be all that useful for this year. So there are some recommendations on, on how to sample. One is to use the old sludge judge. You know, you can, and there's different ways of doing this, but you can put a, you can do a profile sample all the way down to the bottom of the pit. And I think even though it's not uh, perfect, it might be good enough. If you get a profile from top, middle, bottom of the pit, mix it up. Now, this is just one series of samples we see on the right here, but uh, we know that this is the phosphorus content on a series of samples, the top, middle, bottom. You all know this. Phosphorus settles to the bottom. Phosphorus goes to the bottom. Potassium stays dissolved, is pretty much constant throughout. Nitrogen is split between the ammonium nitrogen, which is dissolved, stirred up throughout the pit, and the, the organic nitrogen, which eh, a lot of that goes to the bottom. So... You got to sample the bottom. You can't ignore it, but you can get a, I think, a pretty decent picture of the, uh, the pit if you don't have that history or if you don't trust the history of that uh, that pit sample. I think you can do a pretty decent job with a profile sample for this year. That said, I would also question if you've got an 80-foot wide pit and it's 300 feet long. How many samples do you have to take and from what part of the pit to make sure that you've got a good representation? Because you've got different settling going on at different parts of the pit. So let's just go to the pump outs, you know, pull off the perimeter and say, this is the best we can do. Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe you ought to be going in the center walkway and pulling some samples out of there as, as well in order to get a good representation. The... Uh, on the phosphorus, the proof of the pudding is still going to be what happens with your soil tests over time. You know, are you over-applying phosphorus? Are you keeping kind of steady? And I've done this, uh, what they call uncertainty analysis, of the whole business of, of figuring out how, how to spread manure. And if, if my conclusion is, if you can get within plus or minus 15% of your target application rate, you're in there. 
you're doing pretty good. Plus or minus 15%. And I'll talk to the regulators, tell them blue in the face, to defend that um, so that you don't have to. But I think that uh, you know, if we could do that, we're, we're doing pretty decent for the industry. And it makes a difference in how you do your, your rate calculations, whether you pull the spreader to the end of the row or, or back 200 feet and have to start again, you know, all these kinds of things, um, just how much of that uncertainty are you able to, uh, are you going to put up with? Now, here comes the tough one. Back to that business of, well, Ted's got a salary, you know, he, he doesn't have to manage the farm like I do. But that being said, take it for what it's worth. Man, we need to watch this water management. We need to watch the levels of these pits, both from a regulatory standpoint and so we just flat out don't get in trouble. Water management is a, is a big one. The National Pork Board had a study out a few years ago, uh, and they said, you know, the bottom line is we used 80% of the water in the drinkers, <laughs> so buy good drinkers and stop the leaks. That's the short answer. <laughs> uh, don't put extra water in that pit. Because extra water, you know what's, what's costing. I have seen a beef producer who put roof water into his pit because the manure was too thick to get out. But I don't think, we, we don't see that too much with, with hog producers. So I would say, you know, pay attention to the economics. If it's going to, what, what's it cost? 1.3 cents per gallon to, to spread manure, something like that. That can add up pretty fast if you got a, a water leak, leaky water. Um, so you can really save some big dollars on, on the manure spreading costs if, if you manage the water. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's actually some electronic liquid levels out there, liquid level monitors out there on the market now. That they're, uh, anybody seen those? Anybody got a, a liquid level monitor installed yet? They're coming. They're going to be available, probably pretty decent price that are going to allow you to watch from your desk, watch from your computer, every day what the liquid level is in the pit and keep an eye on it so that you can graph it. And you can say, that sounds like an engineer, Dr. Tim. <laughs> Dr. Lim is going to be, uh, yeah, he's going to be jumping all over this, but you, know, you, can, you can graph how fast your, your pit is filling and figure out, are you going to be able to make it through the winter? Or are you not going to be able to make it through the winter? You can, you, of course, mechanically monitor the, the liquid level. You can go out all winter long and, and slip one of the uh, the pump out lids off and you can put a stick down in there and see what the level is. Or, I'll show you another picture in a minute, but there's a there's a slick way, I, I call it slick, a way to, uh, to monitor the, the liquid level. I think, depending on how you read it, the US EPA regs for CAFOs, for large CAFOs, you're really required to record, monitor, measure and record the level in your manure storages every week. So don't know whether you'll be uh, taking the task on that or not, but you might kind of keep it in mind. And somebody might ask you someday um, for that graph, for those numbers. But then finally, uh, water meters. How many got water meters out there on, on your barn? Bunch of them. Okay. If I'd asked this three, four years ago, Probably very few, but there's going to be a lot of water meters being used and some very good reasons. Find the leaks, but also you can tell, you can anticipate disease issues with the pigs. So water meters, just make sure to record it same time every day because, as we all know, the, the pigs go through a diurnal cycle of, of uh, water use. So you don't have to assume that you have the room in the pit. I'm showing a measuring device here that may or may not be interesting to you, but uh, we used it for a research project, a, a foam research project here a year or so ago, and it didn't cost much to make, and boy, you can get a lot of data in a hurry. So instead of having to, draw, instead of having to drop a tape measure or something in the pit every day, you just measure it from the top of the slats. So get a load of this, take the old PVC, um, toilet flange, turn it upside down, put a bushing in it, inch and a half riser, as tall as you want, okay, and then you get another uh, coupling at the top, do a little work with the saw, go out and buy a Fluke 414D 
laser meter, laser distance measure, and set it in there and so it points down through the bottom. You can line up the notches on the toilet flange with the openings in your slots. You can walk down your hallway, walk down the, the middle alleyway, and punch that meter and take the distance down to the liquid. And it'll measure, you know, it'll keep 10 measurements for you. You can write them down. I won't say no muss, no fuss, but there's not a lot of muss. And uh, leave that thing in the, doesn't cost you, you know, 100 bucks for the meter, a few bucks for the PVC connections, and you got something to measure the depth to, the, it'll measure to the foam. It won't measure to the liquid, but it'll measure to the foam so you can see if things are happening in there and then uh, kind of keep an eye on it. So, but the other thing is, after you have somebody pump this down or you do it yourself and you remember you can't get everything out, if you can measure how much, kind of keep track of how much solids are left in the pit when you're done. And then once again, this device here with a little laser, laser distance meter, you can go through and see how much solids you got any place in. Now you may have, if you build like some of the guys in Illinois, your slotted floor may go like this and you may have to go through. You may want to go through and do a, a survey ahead of time and, and just see how much of hills and valleys you got in, the, in your slotted floor. But in Missouri, I hear the, John Haney, he's been at a long time. I think he's probably got you guys building perfectly level slotted floors so one place as good as the next. Anyway, enough on that. Um, nutrient management planning. Remember, the one side of it is keeping track of when that pit's going to fill up and the other side, and, and also the sampling, but the other side of the coin is your nutrient management plan and how does this all put together. And uh, we've been looking at uh, smartphone apps and things like that to help record the mineral applications, calculate the, the mineral application rates, and so on. Those are available. I even bought one, even... <clears throat> And I don't even have a manure spreader, but I was so fascinated. I paid 99 cents and I got my app from University of Nebraska. So you can check it out, see what it looks like. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it may work for you. So I think there are some, um, there are some tools out there that are, they're going to make it easier for keeping track of what you're doing with your nutrient management plan. But that is so important, that nutrient management plan. So many people in, back in Illinois, I know Missouri people don't do this, but Illinois, Iowa, those guys, they get a CNMP, Comprehensive Nutrient Management Plan, and it comes in a binder that thick, right? Three-inch thick binder, and it goes up on the shelf, and that's the end of, end of story, you know? And somebody come back to ask you about your records that are supposed to go in that thing to kind of keep it updated. Records, what in the records, records? Oh, yeah, you mean that little, that piece of paper that I keep in the tractor cab with the to my load tallies off on it. Yeah, I got records, but they're not in the, they haven't really updated the nutrient management plan. Anyway, point is, need to keep up with the, both from a regulatory perspective and if you're in a uh, equip contract or something, need to keep those, those records updated. Now, about that valuing the liquid manure, we can fairly easily make a computation. If you've got good, reliable samples of your manure, you can make a pretty good computation with uh, replacing fertilizer cost, pretty decent. So you can at least make a case to the neighbor of what the value of that manure is if you need all of the fertilizer components in the manure. If for some reason the soil test of that target area is such that, for instance, that they got a high phosphorus test already, eh, it's a little hard to make the case for selling phosphorus in the manure even though it comes in the package. So, you know, just be aware of that, that you may or may not be able to, uh, to price all three of the nutrients fully that shows up in the test, but that's certainly a good place to start with the arguing. And you know what the spreading costs are, or if you don't want know what your spreading costs are, you can go to extension University of Missouri .edu and, and they've got a pretty neat uh, site for helping you with the, the spreading costs. And, that, and that's from an economist, that's a John Laurie guy. You know, I, he's, he's good with all the numbers. You can figure out what it actually costs you to, to spread manure. So you got the cost to spread. You got fertilizer value. Boy, you go to that guy with a handful of dollar bills coming at you, and you're in the money. 
Um, just a note on, on pit additives, and we've kind of covered this a little bit, but the fourth, the big four, I think, that we hear about are reducing odor, reducing toxic gases, managing the solids, managing the crust, and retaining nutrients and making them more plant available. And, and this is, yeah, this is Missouri. I had to throw that in. Show me. <laughs> because uh, there are a lot of conflicting reports out there on manure additives. And should we write them all off? No. I think they're worth uh, doing some experimenting with, and they're going to probably change from farm to farm because diets change, genetics are different, and management situations are different. So I wouldn't say that, they're, uh, that, that you should dismiss all additives out of hand, but do um, realize that if you use some kind of additives, you may find some, uh, some other results, perhaps unexpected results that come along with those as well. So a couple of things on new construction, and then we're going to wrap this up unless you have some questions. In Illinois, we have this process where our uh, Illinois Department of Ag goes out and once they, they issue a, a permit to start building, they also go out and, and, and do a, an inspection before you start building. They watch you as you, they check on you as you're built, and they also sign off on it when it's done. So this is not the structure above the pit, but uh, the pit has to be checked out. And so there's some interesting things that, that, uh, that show up. And so, well, the ones that make photographs aren't pleasant because nobody wants to see the, you know, the common stuff. But I would say, you know, choose your contractor carefully. And this is your brother-in-law that's, you know, that says he's got all the tools, and, but he's never built one before. I'd be a little careful because this is a big deal. <laughs> this is a big thing you're building. And even something as simple as some honeycombing in a, in a column. You think about all the load that that bugger is going to be carrying. That's a lot of concrete, not to mention the pigs and the structure above it. And if we start getting some corrosion, yep, we've got some honeycombing, corrosion going on in, into those, uh, those columns, we're just about done. <laughs> But we also don't want to end up with that thing in the pit. Well, there's, there's honeycombing issues. Department of Ag comes down hard on the poor concrete quality, especially when it comes down to making sure that that tank is going to hold manure. For some reason, for some reason, the regulators want to make sure that those tanks are going to hold manure. They're treated almost as if it, it could be a pollutant. Don't quite understand it, but that's what they do. So we use water stops. We use all kinds of things straight out of the handbook for making a, a concrete tank to hold a liquid that shouldn't get away. Things like pouring in the rain, you know, probably going to get to do this thing over again because that concrete is not, they're going to take a core sample because they saw it being poured in standing water. They'll take a core sample and they'll send it out and test it. If it doesn't make strength, they'll make them do a cap over it. Not fun. Get a two by four stuck in a, in a poured wall. <laughs> That's not going to fly either, so you have to dig that out. So, you know, these Illinois guys, they're, they're kind of sticklers for, for quality. But I would bring this, I bring this up because I think it's, it's important for longevity of the structure um, just to make sure that it, it does what it's supposed to do. Floor caps, uh, we've had situations where they've had to come back and pour a second floor cap because of all the cracks. And this, the first recap didn't work, and then the second... Another retread, you might say. So just be real careful to, to follow all the, the recommendations that are they're out there. The concrete and ACI tell you how to do this. Perimeter drainage tubing, we get into that. That's actually a requirement in some situations in our state. So you put a foundation drainage. Don't ask me why, because I'll get off on a very long diatribe on whether we should or should not have perimeter drainage tubing. But this is the kind of things that we, we run into. Uh, cracked floors, heavy equipment being on the floor too soon, things like that. This is one. This was a test case in uh, in Illinois. We had some uh, grout around a a wall penetration. A water pipe came in through the wall of a tank, and that grout came out, and so did the manure, and that wasn't cool. So that changed the rules in Illinois. Uh, things about backfilling. Just all this is just to make the point that it's very important to do the good job of, uh, of building that concrete tank because it has to do a lot of things. It has to control, it has to contain the manure, 
keep it ready, provide, of course, part of your ventilation system. Also support the, uh, support the building and just uh, and, and protect the environment. So in summary, these three things, you know, we talk about safety, indoor air quality, environmental protection, and then uh, best use of the nutrients.